Um, we, just like I'm Ron gonna... was mentioning, just like Ron was mentioning, we're going to talk about vectors tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of vectors that are available to us. And um, I was I was tasked with leading the discussion tonight. I don't know how much discussion there will be because um, a lot of this stuff is kind of foundational still because we're still in the foundation section. Um, but again, if there's any time that we do need to stop, just let me know and we can further discuss. And if we get through most of the material tonight, then what we'll do is uh, we'll talk about the questions that we have uh, or some of the exercises that we worked on. If anybody has any of those questions, you know, please raise them because um, we'll cover those if we have time. So I'm trying to see here. Desktop one. Share. Can everybody see my slides? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. I just want to make sure yep. I'm trying to do them more on my um I'm trying to do them more on my laptop. So I'm looking at my camera rather than the side. So so uh I just kind of identified some learning objectives for chapter number three. I think these are what we should be getting out of this chapter. Um I have to be honest, a lot of this stuff, a lot of these notes basically came from the R4DS community, which um, somebody already put these together and I went through them and I reviewed them and I thought they were really well put together. So I only made some minor modifications to them. So uh, what I think we should be getting out of this is we should be able to, at the end of this, be able to discuss the different vector types that are available in R. Uh, also, what we're going to do during this session is we're going to observe how to create, coerce, and test different vector types. And then we're also going to learn how these different types relate to one another. And so to start off, the book really kind of starts with this, this kind of diagram, this family tree of vectors, which I think really kind of solidifies how the different vector types are related to each other. And so it starts off with the basic family tree. Uh, what is a vector? Well, the book considers a vector um, three different types. There are the atomic vector types, which we'll talk about. There's four of them. Then we have the list which references different vector types. And then the book also mentions that null, although it's technically not a vector, should be considered in this family of vectors. And so null is the absence of, of any type of data. And so it's just part of this vector discussion. And so uh, when it comes to this, the book kind of really describes and kind of summarizes atomic vectors. If you have an atomic vector, all elements need to be the same type. And we'll talk about what that means, especially when we talk about scalar values and the different types of scalar values that R uh, makes available to us. Then we have lists. Lists are elements. Uh, lists can contain many different data, data types. Uh, also lists uh, provide for us the ability to make lists within lists within lists. And within those lists, it can contain any different types of data within it. And then obviously the null, which is null elements, which is a length zero vector type. And so it's just the absence of any values. And so those are kind of just the basic three types of vectors that the book discusses. Now, when we first talk about atomic vectors, it breaks it down even further. And so we have to kind of start with, again, expanding this vector family tree. And so <clears throat> let's take a look at how these things are related. Again, we start at the very abstract level of vector drilling down into the atomic types. The atomic types drill down into numeric, which there's two different numeric types, integer and double. And then there's other two atomics, which is logical and character. Logical being true, false, also represented as zero and one. Character um, in other, put it another way, is just string data, right? Um, Integer is an integer. Double allows you for floating point types of data. So decimal points are available in double types. So what are the what are so let's take a look at length one vectors here. So length one vectors. So R provides for us scalar values to start building our vectors. And with these scalar values, um, it has they're just the most atomic level of data that you can have within R. And most of us have been pretty have been introduced to these. Many of us use these every single day. But just to kind of highlight them again, you have logicals, which obviously in R, it's all capital T R U E for true, all capitals for false F A L S E. There is a shortcut available, which is the capital T and the capital F. However, the book mentions that you should be avoiding this. Uh, you should be avoiding capital T and capital F within your code because mainly it can be confusing and you should be using the true type. 
I actually did a little bit of digging into this a little bit more, but um, actually capital T and capital F are just technically variables that are referencing the true and false value. So I always, these are just, I always use uh, abbreviations. Yeah, it's just super easy. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. No, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, that's like one of those like early R things that you learn and it's not super enormous but yeah when you're doing a bunch of different arguments as true or false it does save a little time as you know just have just to do the t and the f i guess i mean yeah anyway that's all yeah and so i was i was kind of interested in this a little bit more too and um if you use any like linter so like if you use a code linter or anything like that like lint r if you run one of those linters it will point out that just based on your style guide that you should be using the full true and false Oh, wow. instead of the abbreviated T and F. And there's different, you know, again, that's just based on the style guide that you follow, but, you know, it still works. It's still valid code. So if you're using the capital T or the capital F, it's still valid. Um, but technically just that T and F are just variables that are referencing this object true and false. Mm -hmm. so. And that you can redefine. You can go into your R right now and say F equals true. <laughs> and then from mm -hmm. then on, F will be true. <laughs> So Let's not do danger. that. That's the danger. <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a bad idea, but uh, I like it. Yeah, somebody might sneak into your office and do that someday when you're not looking. <laughs> Hopefully not. Keep keep them guessing. Keep them on their toes, right? See if they're actually reading your code. Right. Um. Can I don't think you can. I don't think you can re. I know you can do the capital T and capital F. Can you reassign like the true and false values, or do you get? That's a great question. I don't know if you can. Mm. I'm sure you can. Sure, there's some way can, to do it, but no, you can also, oh, you can't. Wow. No, true is uh, not valid on the left hand side of an assignment. The word mm. the, it's a special yeah. keyword, right? Yeah, it's one of those reserved words. And if you're interested in seeing the reserved words, I think you just go question mark reserved mm. and then I it will pull up all the reserved words. Yeah, I, 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 I listed them in my like little slides last week. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, it's not that many. So I guess kind of talking about there with the capital T or using the full GRUE or FALSE, it's best to use this because you can't overwrite those values. So if if I think that's one argument for why you should be writing it out. If you're in Python, you're obviously using T underscore RUE and you always get mixed up. And so that's something that's been tripping me up when I when I write in Python is the true and false are different, but 100% with you on that. <laughs> I always, always get that mixed up, which because I've been doing it in R, it's always, anyways, moving on from there. Uh, there's doubles. Uh, doubles can be represented as integers. They can be represented as decimals. They can be written in scientific notation, obviously using the E. And then um, hexadecimal, which uh, I definitely went down a little bit of a rabbit hole uh, learning about hexadecimal, which I don't know how much time that's going to be valuable for me. But if you do need it, it is available for you um, as, a, uh, as a scalar value. Mm. Integers are similar to doubles, but you're just appending this L, which denotes it as an integer. So you have one L. Uh, I'm not sure if this is valid, the 1.234 L. I think it just automatically coerces to the lowest number. But now that I'm just looking at it, I'm really curious, 1.234 L. It gives you a warning message gives you a warning message that says integral or integer literal 1.234 contains a decimal using a numeric value. So it looks like it just automatically coerces it to a numeric. Mm. So, you, so this is not valid. Um, I would assume that these are the same two as well, because a new, uh, an, an integer value technically needs to be a full number or whole number. So um, I might play around with these a little bit later, but anyways, if you want to denote an integer or use an integer type, it has to have that L appended to it. Strings are interesting. Uh, strings um, in R, double quotes or single quotes, you can either use either. For consistency, if you are writing code based on your style guide, I would probably suggest picking one or the other. I use double quotes, but if you use single quotes, that's fine. Um, you can also use different representations as well or different encodings. So you can use Unicode. So if you want to write in Arabic, that is a valid character, that is a valid character that it will set. And then if you want to use other Unicode symbols such as this, so this is obviously the sweetie smile emoji, 
it, that is technically a, a string value as well, or a character value as the book defines it. So you don't have to just use the English um, AC characters. You can also use Unicode characters as well, and they're defined as strings. So any questions about these different scalar types? Or what questions do people have about these scalar types? Funny, like a lot of these things, I mean, I remember learning these in my first like R class and it doesn't really pop up <laughs> a whole, some of these don't pop up a whole lot for me, at least. I mean, I'm sure everyone's different, but yeah, these special cases. Of, I mean, I, I think the, I think the ones that I come across, a lot, well, I guess I come across all of them, but mostly logical double and character. Yeah. I mean, integers maybe sometimes, but I don't come across integer very often, but it's definitely a logical doubler character. Yeah, that sounds about right. I don't run um, into too many hexadecimal scalars. <laughs> like I said, if you you could go down a rabbit hole for about uh, about an hour or so learning about hexadecimal, it's really interesting, but um, for what I do, it's not very useful. Um, but yeah, so I, much of it is like what you do. Like I have friends who do like um, maps and like spatial stuff and, you know, it's a whole other ball of wax, right? I mean, different like, you know, um, we call it like coordinates, you know, as and, and stuff like, I mean, I'm sure that that's, that's a whole other thing. I mean, but it's funny how like, you know, if you don't do stuff with it, it's, it's just um, doesn't come up too much. Well, it's still a numeric value. It's just a well, different yeah, yeah, representation. Yeah, yeah. No. No, I it's just, just meant, a different like, definition. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I just meant in general, it's like, yeah, there are a whole bunch of, you know, usage types that just don't probably come up for everybody because, you know, it's whatever their specific, you know, job is. Anyway, that was, that was it. It wasn't really that profound. <laughs> no, I think that's interesting because, I mean, it's available. Why is it available? So, you know, obvious, most of us probably run into scientific notation when we have our decimals sent are our options set and then we sometimes get like a very large number returned so we're all pretty used to used yeah. to this but it it's available if you need it and it's interesting to kind of see that it is available I, i'm sure there's somebody out there that is using hexadecimal for something but uh okay cool um so what if we need to make longer vectors so instead of being a length one vector how do we make it longer well most of us are probably used to um, using the c for concatenation concatenation just basically means put these things together right and so here's just two scalar logical um, values true and false we put them together with c if we looked at this and we did logical vector it would just be a vector of true and false um, there are some additional ways to do this that the book talked about that I wasn't really familiar with, but I don't do this very often. But if you take uh, a concatenated values of one and two and concatenated values three and four, and then you can concatenate these two ve vectors together, say those five times fast, you'll get one uh, four length long vector one through four. So um, I'm not, I wasn't as familiar with this, but just so you know the behavior of it, if you do this, it will create one length vector. Now, these were in the notes. These weren't really in the book. Um, I'm not totally familiar with R Lang as much as I probably should be, but these notes, I kind of read a little bit as I kind of was reviewing these notes, but R Lang also has some additional vector constructor functions too. So if you're trying to construct specific vectors like a logical vector, integer vector, double vector, character vector, there are some construct constructor um, functions that you can use. Um, the, the notes kind of talk about why would you do this beyond C? Well, you get to explicitly force what the vector is by doing it this way, right? So you mm. can enforce the type, you get the splice list, and it provides you other additional types of vectors. So the book talks about I think it was bytes and complex and Arlang has some explicit ways to create those. And there's also some stricter rules on the different naming that you can use for this. Uh, if you do read the documentation, which when I first looked at the Arlang documentation for this stuff, you'll see some of those D plier things that say um, like questioning or depreciating. The only reason why it's questioning is because Hadley's been writing this new package called vectors and they're questioning if these functions should be moved from Arlang into that vectors package. So I don't think that they're they're going to be going away, but they are potentially getting moved to vectors um, later on. So is anybody here familiar with Arlang? I've, I mean, I, I, at one point I, I, I got serious about reading about it and 
and do, doing stuff with it but um i have to be honest yeah it never really has really gone anywhere except for like probably like little things here and there like little solutions that might involve the, the use of it but yeah I really don't use it very much, but again, like if you read some of those, if you read some of the reference material for some of these like constructor functions, you'll see, and I'm trying to find, see if I can find them real quick. Um, you'll see like, they'll say like depreciated and stuff in them. Uh, character vector. I'll find it later. I should have had it queued up for a presentation, but just know that these things are questioning because they're thinking about moving it into this vectors package, which... I tried to read what vectors was about. Um, I still think it's like really, really abstract for me to understand like what, it, what its usefulness is. I've just pulled up the documentation here, but this is like a package that Hadley's been working on called vectors. And I think it's mainly focused on vector development and the use of vectors. So I just realized that's probably in the recording. So I'm going to take that out. So Hadley's never going to give us a chance to catch up, is he? <laughs> okay, write stuff too fast. See, when I like, okay, the other thing that I like about Hadley's books is he kind of like sprinkles in some of the tidyverse stuff into it. So when we get to like Tibbles and like Tibbles and data frames, you could kind of, kind of, kind of feel that like sense of like, yeah, data frames are great, but maybe you should be using the tidyverse way to use them. Yeah, so. For sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how like some of the stuff is like, there's like another package in the tidyverse realm. That's like trying to do the same thing base R does, but trying to do like have different rules for it. So, um, but anyways, if you're looking at constructing them, there's another way to do it outside of what the book talks about. So, uh, there's missing values. So, um, for most computations an operation over values that includes a missing value yields a missing value, uh, unless you're careful. So if you're just trying to do multiplication five times NA, you're going to get an NA value because anything times an NA is going to get returned as an NA. If you try and sum these things together. So if you have a vector of one, two, three, and an NA here, you're going to get NA unless you inoculate it, uh, using the NA.RM equals true. Most of us are probably used to this uh, if we're trying to get like a simple, like a mean, um, if we're trying to do like a mean function here, if you have some missing NA values and you want to get returned a mean value, you have to use the NA.RM. Again, the reason of that being is, is because NA values, um, they're contagious, right? If you have an NA in your vector, it's going to return an NA. So uh, there's also different types of NA. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about these because the book at, at the conclusion of this section was basically like, Hey, just so you know, this is a, this is a thing, but you probably don't need to know about it because it's going to coerce correctly to the right um, to the right NA that you need for the specific context. However, the notes do mention if you're working in the context of a dplyr if else function, you need to be aware that the type of NA that you're using is important. And so if you're using this dplyr if else function, make sure you know what type of NA type you're using. So what if we want to test? Uh, testing is basically our basic all we have to use is the is dot type of test that we need. So if we're testing for a logical is dot logical integer is dot integer double or character. And the book mentions that you probably should you be using these ones to do your testing for the specific types outside of doing these kind of other generic functions of is dot vector is dot atomic or is dot numeric. Um, there was a question that focused specifically on these questions or on the use of these different functions and why you shouldn't use them. Um, I am still not 100% clear on why we're not supposed to use some of these functions. So would there be anybody out there that did that exercise that would be able to illuminate a little bit more for my mental model why we're not supposed to use these? I do, I do remember reading something about that some not not in this book but in other things but yeah I, I did not do the exercise just... well the exercise basically was like hey go look at the documentation for is dot atomic is dot numeric and then like figure out why it's not i think I, yeah i, I looked ahead, at it Ron. briefly i mean if i remember correctly is vector the problem with that one is that um it doesn't do what you think it does for example it says that null is a vector and maybe that's not what you want 
also Remember like we... lists too since like lists are lists aren't recursive vectors, vectors. Yeah. well they're recurring right they are like they are i think i didn't actually check the health but i think it has to think that think might it's also only be two, an issue it's only atomic vectors i think it should be called is atomic vector maybe i don't know <laughs> I see. think there was also something too with like oh, there's like something. Time. Oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So actually, I'm even reading this description for is dot vector, and it just starts with so a vector in R right is either an atomic vector right that we've been talking about right. It's one of the atomic types or of type of type of or mode list or expression. So it's like is dot vector probably doesn't map to what you think of as like. Oh, like a character, a numeric vector, right? It could also include like lists or expressions in R, which mm. probably is something that you don't want necessarily. Um, I mean, depending right on your application, but I think that's probably a lot of the confusion is that like, I think when you're working with lists in R, obviously, yeah, they're vectors, but you don't think of them really as vectors. You just think of them as like lists. Yeah, as you were talking there, I was kind of re reading the notes that I had for my answers too. Was like with is dot vector, it's it it's only going to return true if you specify a mode having no attributes other than names. Um, so I would assume that it has to do something with the attributes. So it's not technically testing if it's a, really a vector. It's just mm -hmm. testing if that object does not have an attribute attached to it. Is the way I understand it, right? And that's not technically, that's technically not a true test of what a vector is, right? Um, same thing with like numeric too, I think is kind of a similar thing. It's like numeric says is a more general test of an object being interpretable as numbers. Well, there's all kinds of numbers that may not be the right number that you want. So if you wanted a more valid test of a number, you should be using like is double dot is integer. So because you know, if you're using an integer when you're supposed to be using a double, it's technically uh, not correct. So, so is the issue um, that is that vector? Like, I just tested this out. Like, I created a simple vector, uh, and I said is vector. Like, this is like a vector with like one and two, a c c one and two, right? Mm -hmm. And I said is vector. I said yes. Then I gave it some wacky attribute like xf or something like that, and then it says, oh, it's not a vector anymore. So, is that the problem that when you give it attributes, it suddenly is no longer a vector according to is vector? Yeah. Yeah, I see. I yeah, yeah. So it's, that. yeah, it's not a valid test, right? It's just testing yeah. the attributes portion of it. Mm, um, that's weird. It's a badly named function, right? <laughs> Is yeah, pure like vector just, maybe? I don't know. I feel like you just get rid of that. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I know, mm -hmm. I know, core, like, like core, the core team of R is like very slow with some stuff, but like, I don't know. <laughs> it's something I feel like you get rid of. I mean, like, if I look back at some of the old code that I've written, like, is numeric sometimes is there. Like, I see it. Like, I used to use this dot numeric. Yeah, you know, I definitely did. But I think I think it's really going back. I think, like, what's the book's trying to get across is, like, if you do have to test, you should be attesting one of the atomic types and not, like, to be like, is it a vector? Is it atomic? But rather do the actual type. Um, so... Cool. Excellent. Um, so there's some discussion about some more Rlang functions. Again, there's some other tests that Rlang provides. Take a look at them if you're interested in them. They're, they do have specific ones for is vector ah, and is atomic, but I haven't dug into good. it. So, excuse me. Useful. Um, so then the book kind of talks about coercion. Uh, the, the R follows specific coercion rules, um, how it follows coercion. Coercion the way I just put it into a simple sentence is like, it's like automatic transformation. So R will automatically transform things when it does um, certain things. And so these are the rules it follows. It goes from character, takes precedence over double, double takes precedence over integer, and integer takes precedence over logical. And so we'll see some of these coercion rules that happen. Uh, just know that these happen automatically or explicitly. So the two types of contexts to which automatic coercion takes place is whether we're combining uh, values together, so scalar values together, or in a mathematical operation. So when we do combination, say we're trying to put these two, um, two scalars together, we have this logical scalar of true, and then this string value of true, it's gonna coerce it to character because character takes precedent over logical. 
right mm. so that makes yeah. sense go ahead no i was gonna say that yeah that, that does make sense yeah and then it also happens in mathematical operations so let's just take this uh four length long vector of um I was going to say Boolean, but they're not Boolean, but they're logical. Um, true, false, true, and true. Uh, technically, true and false can be coerced into an integer value. And somebody correct me if I'm, if that's right or wrong, if it's integer value, yeah. but to ones and zeros, right? Yeah. And so because it can be transformed or coerced into an integer value, we can do math with it. And so we can create a sum of it. And so if we create a sum of true, false, true, true, we get the value returned three. And so the reason that is, is because of these coercion <laughs> rules, right? Integer takes precedence over logical. And so we get three returned. Um, there's also like a really interesting exercise in here. And again, I don't work with matrix or matrices quite a bit. So I didn't spend a lot of time with it, but I think it was like, uh, it was one of the ending exercises where it kind of plays around with these coercion rules inside of matrices. And it was really interesting to see how like true and false values would be converted to ones and zeros. And so it was just kind of neat to see how that kind of worked in the context of a matrix. But again, it was, I don't use matrices. And so I just didn't dig too much into it, but it was kind of neat to see those coercion rules at play. If you need to be explicit, uh, there just like is, uh, there is as, so you can use as logical, as integer, as double as character. Um, just to make a note of this, uh, this may fail in two ways. So you may get a warning or an error and R will automatically coerce certain things into NAs. So if we have this as dot integer where we're trying to be explicit with this three length long vector of one, two, and then a string value three, it's going to give you the warning NA is introduced by coercion. So reason of that being is because it's trying to coerce this, um, character vector into a um not numeric but like a double i think it's going to be an integer and so it's going to throw a warning and say hey we just introduced an na into your vector here's your vector one two na so i think these are this was kind of like the first error or warning that i've ever ran into when, when i was playing around with r was the oh yeah hey <laughs> na is introduced by coercion and then you just sit there and you say like oh no did i do something wrong well now you know what's going on here. It's just, it's dealing with the atomic types and the coercion rules. Hmm. Uh, let's move on to attributes. I thought this was really kind of interesting. Um, so when it comes to attributes, there's the what, the how, and then the why. And so you could kind of break this down a little bit. So what are attributes? Um, there's kind of two perspectives to this. Um, when there, When there's attributes, you have name value pairs. So they're considered to be name value pairs. So you can attach attributes on to specific vectors um, and you can give it a specific name and then provide a value to that. There's also, you can expand it. Those values can be a list, which goes a little bit beyond my understanding, but some of the examples that showed that. And then the other perspective is it's just metadata. It's metadata that you attach to specific vectors um, to determine its structure and its behavior. And so when we talk about this, the name value pairs, formally attributes have a name and then they have a value. And when it comes to metadata, um, it's not data itself, but it's data about the data, right? And so it's just adding additional information to the data that you have. So how do we set attributes for these different, uh, for these different data structures? We use, we can either get it or we can set it. Um, we can either set single attributes or we can set multiple attributes all at once. So here's the example from the notes. Say we have this vector of integers one, two, and three. Assign that to or reference it using this um, name A. We could set the attributes with this attribute function. Um, and we could set it with uh, to some attribute name, giving it this value here. If we want to get this back, if we want to get this attribute, some attribute name back, we just call it which some attribute name, and it returns that value of some attribute. If we want to set multiple attributes to it, here again, we're just going to have this, uh, we're going to have this object of integers, four, five, six, reference it, giving it the name B. We could set it with structure, 
And then we could give all of these different attribute names, different values. So we have the name and then we have the value. So here's the name value pair. And if we want to get those attributes, we just run structure attributes on that reference name, and then it will return all of those attributes for us. At this point in the reading, this is where I was like, I was kind of struggling a little bit because I knew that it's just, it was the terminology. I knew that certain objects had attributes and you could change those attributes and you could set them. But in the context with some of the objects that I use, I was, I was getting, getting a little confused. Um, but I think I, I was catching on to it a little bit because you basically can create any data structure you want using these. And I think we'll get more into that when we start talking about S3, um, because it, this is the S3 system, which oddly enough, I figured out where S3 and S4 came from that name. Uh, this is just a side note, but S3 uh, gets its name because it was the object oriented. It was the object oriented system that was introduced on the third version of S. And S4 is because it was the fourth version of the object-oriented system that was introduced in the fourth version of S. So do you need to know that? Probably not, but just a little interesting tidbit if you're interested where S3, where the name S3 and S4 came from. But I've, I've changed the attribute to like put level, um, put uh, labels on uh, variables. Has anyone else done that? That's like a pretty handy thing. I have not. Tell me more. Well, you can like you can change one of the attributes to be a label and then uh, set the label based on the variable. Hold on. I got to step away for one sec. No, you're good. Well, that brings up a good point. I don't know. Does anybody still work with like uh, SPSS files or SAS files in their data analyses or some of their work? I'm thinking of Ryan because I know he does yeah, some of this. Yeah, Ryan has said he's used to that stuff, so <laughs> he's probably the guy. <laughs> so like SPSS and SAS, like, so there's a package called Haven. Uh, if you work with any of those files, go use the package Haven. But SAS and SPSS are really kind of known for some of that extra metadata that gets attached to your data files. So it's not a rectangular, it's not just a rectangular structure like you get like from a CSV or an XLSX. And so... I think Haven works with trying to use those attributes to get it into a rectangular structure. And so that's where this kind of comes into play. Um, so why? Um, there's two common use cases. So the most of the data objects that we use, they're going to have names and dimensions, especially if we get to data frames and tibbles. Um, there's the book says three. Um, the notes that I kind of came across said four ways. And again, it's going to be the Rlang packages is going to provide that fourth way but you can either do it at the creation of the vector. So here's this vector one, concatenate it with one. Here's the name one, two, and three, and then the values one, two, and three. Pretty, pretty basic. Everybody should be kind of familiar with this one. The other one is uh, assigning a character using the names function. So we can create the vector first and then afterwards do names and then give it this other vector of the actual names that are strings. Uh, I don't, I haven't used this too often, but I've seen it in a lot of code out in the wild. I've seen people use this, um, but I'm used to maybe usually creating them up front, but I could also see this use um, if you needed to rename those vector objects. And then also you can use by using set names um, from the stats package, which is part of the R core. Uh, you can set the object, which is three, and then just give it this NM argument with the vector of names one, two, and three. Rlang is very similar. It gives you a set underscore names function, um, pretty similar. Give it the object, give it the vector of names, and you have it named. And then Haven comes up here again, but you also have this labeled function that allows you to work um, with different class of vectors, um, again, dealing with those SPSS and SAS files. If you are somebody that works with uh, matrix, um, you know, there's not only the names, but the dimensions. So if you need some type of matrix structure, you will just set uh, your dimensions uh, attribute. And basically when you create a matrix, so if you're gonna create a two by three matrix with one through six, you just give it N rows two and column three. And this sets the dimension attributes to two and three, and then you'll get a two by three matrix, but I don't really work with matrices very often, but if you do, it is available to you. Just know that it's just setting the dimension to create the matrix structure. So, 
So let's move on to S3. Let's let's get a little bit more complex here. Um, so we're going to expand this this family of atomic this atomic vector tree a little bit more, and start working with some um, more different vectors that we probably use outside of just the logical integer doubler character. So the three that we're going to expand to this is going to be factor and then POSIX and date. And we're going to talk about these because these different um, vectors are built on top of the integer and double atomic vector types. And they have some really interesting behaviors with them. Uh, there are some notes in here that the the notes added these to this. Um, I really didn't follow along with this, but if you want to kind of learn more about the vector types, there's a couple talks that are linked here. I'm not going to talk about it too much because I didn't dig too deep into it because when I read the vectors um, documentation, I just didn't see the use case for it just yet. But when we talk about S3 atomic vector types, um, we could talk about their different parents. Now there's two different types of uh, things that we need that get attached to these S3 types. It's going to be the class and it's going to be the attributes typically. So the first kind of S3 atomic vector type is going to be factors. Uh, factors are built on top of integers. And so if you take a look at a factor, when you build a factor, they're actually built on top of an integer um, atomic vector type. And so if you create this, if you create this, you're going to get a class factor, and then you're going to get an attribute, which is going to be an attribute levels, which allows you to set the value, to set the levels. And so um, here's an example. We use this function called factor. We give it the values of X, C, one, two, three. And then we also set the different levels, levels being one, two, three, four. So basically what it's doing with this levels attribute is it's setting what is the order of these levels, right? And so it has to go one, two, three, four. If you wanted to, you could set your levels to have four go, go before three if you wanted to. Um, but uh, in this case, it's just doing them in order here to make it look like this. If you run factor uh, and just print it out, it will print out what you have and then it will print out the different levels. What's nice about a factor is if you work with categorical data and you have known levels of data, it's good to put it into a factor because then it will allow you to keep the different levels. So in our case here, we don't have four. And so, but we know that this data could have a fourth level added to it. So if we ever did some like computation on this and we wanted to add up the different levels or the occurrence of different levels in this, it will always include the fourth level in its computation. But in our case right here, if we did that, it would just say zero because we don't have zero. We know it's a level, but we don't have an observation that is part of it. So uh, you can use type of, type of as a function to see what it's, to see what is the atomic type it's built on. And in our case for a factor, it becomes an integer and we can see the different attributes that are associated with the factor. Here's the levels. If you want to go beyond just some of the base stuff, I do highly suggest uh, the package called 4Cats. 4Cats uh, is a great um, package to help you work with factors. Um, excellent package if you deal with a lot of factors. It provides a lot of different functionality um, to work with factors and different factor levels. Um, Factors can be ordered, uh, which we already talked about. Um, you could change the levels of those if you want to, um, which we already talked about, so I'm not going to dig too much into it, but you just set the levels here. And then here's your ordered factor, 4, 3, 2, 1, so on and so forth. Dates. Most of us have probably worked with dates before, but dates are built on top of the atomic vector, a double, and they have this class called date. Um, so basically, if you look at it, uh, if you looked at the numeric value, that dates are built on, it's every second past 1970-0101. If you're interested where this comes from, this is the, and Ron, you could probably correct me on this, this is the Linux epoch. Um, it's just basically an arbitrary date that was just generally accepted as like the starting date of all dates. Um, but I don't know, Ron, if you want to add to that, because you're more of my computer science guy, but that's basically what I know about Yeah, it. Unix, not Linux, but yeah, it Linux. predates Linux. <laughs> Unix, excuse me. Yeah. It's it's a Unix epoch, it's not yeah. a Linux epoch. Yep. Um, but yeah, basically, it's just the number of seconds 
um, beyond that. Uh, there's a couple systems that I work with, the database system, that it represents it based off of this. It gives you the integer value. And what they provide for you is different functions to calculate off of that. Um, I know some other representations outside of like R, they'll use milliseconds, which just gets a little, I think a little much, but um, yeah, it's just a different representation. But in R, just know that it's built on, uh, it's built on an integer value or no, it's built on a double, excuse me, not integer, double. You could check this. So if you run sys.date, this function will give you what your system date currently is. And then if you do a type of on this, um, on this object or on this name to this object sysdate, it will give you a double because it's both on a double. If you check out its class attribute, you'll see that it's a date. So date times are a little bit, go a little bit further. So with dates, there are two date time representations in base R. There's POSIX CT, which denotes calendar time and POSIX LT, which designates local time. Um, I, I need to get better about this. Usually I just try and uh, sometimes when I see the POSIX, I just kind of like just go to Luber date and just fix it right away. Um, so I probably should get better with the POSIX CT and POSIX LT in my own work, but just know that there is a difference between them. The book just focuses on calendar time because it's the simplest to work with. Uh, know that it's built on, again, it's built on atomic vector and um, it's most apt if you're using a data frame um, to be in that data frame. So let's just look at this real quick and destruct it real quick. So we can build an as.posic CT. We can force or we can explicitly coerce it into a POSIX CT, take the system time, and time zone allows you to set the specific time zone. In this case, we're using Eastern time. We look at it. Here's what gets returned. If we dissect it with type of, we can see it's a dot, it's a double. If we look at the attributes, we see POSIX CT and POSIX XT is returned. So, and then there's durations. I don't really work with durations very often, but again, this is another S3 atomic vector type that's built on this. Um, it's just built on a double vector. Its class is diff time and its attributes is gonna be a unit, which basically is the unit that's being represented. Is it a week? Is it an hour? Is it a minute? Is it a second? I think you can go as far as microseconds with this S3 atomic vector, but someone should check me on that. Um, but how do you set that? Just um, coerce it with as.diff time. One, give it the attributes units, which we're putting into minutes, inspect it. It returns it, prints it like this. It's built on a double, looking at type of, and here's the attributes, class, diff time, units missing. If you do use any of these um, extensively, whether they be dates or date times, highly suggest looking at the Luberdate package. It will simplify, like, it's just magic. Um, just check it out, but just know that it's built on, it's built, it's built on this atomic vector of a double, and it's just adding different attributes to it, so. I never use clock. Has anybody ever used clock for any of their work? No, no, not so much. What's 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 up with that? I've never used clock. I've used Luberdate. Have other people used Luberdate here? I feel like Luberdate is like the standard. I, I guess I, I what's what's the difference between that and clock? I have no idea. That's why I was posing as the group to see if anybody's ever mm -hmm. used used clock. Mm -mm. Date, time, types, and tools. I guess it gives you just some functionality and some... I'm just looking at the readme right now. It's just a package for working with date times. Oh. So I wonder if it gives you more functionality and if you're going to use like, you know, POSIX CT stuff rather than just like date, right? Because date would just be built on like, you know, year, month, day but then clock probably expands it into using like just the actual, the time version of it as well. So hmm. that's would be my guess. Yeah, but, I mean, you, you can you can use Luberdate to like isolate the, the time or the, the date. So I don't, yeah, I guess I'm, I'll have to look into that. I can't see what the, what the benefit is of clock, but we'll see. I mean, does anybody here do like study or have any data that's like, that requires them to be, 
at the precision of like an hour or like a day or an hour or a minute yeah i have well and i i have had the thing where um like i was doing um like admissions into the e, um into the um ed and you would want to like um look at how many hours after they were admitted were they given drugs or something so i mean it was like you were looking for a time difference in hours or or even minutes sometimes um so yeah sometimes but it's pretty rare dates are my thing mostly yeah uh yeah i could see that i mean when you look at like when you look at like scheduling for certain things like daytime schedules for like television or radio because that's what i normally work in or even like website usage during the day you can get down to the hour but like minutes and seconds it's like that's just too micro of what we're mm -hmm. looking at so yeah all right cool uh I posted so this uh, i'll go I ahead, go ahead. A, i just posted a quick thing from a blog about the what clock does and compares it to what Luberdate does is for future reading. Cool. One of the main things, I guess, is it's fast because it's based on a C++ clock library that's used out there. Oh, that's so cool. Not meant mm -hmm. to replace, but as an alternative, they said. Oh, huh, that's cool. Yeah, the only other thing, the only other thing that gets in there is obviously daylight savings time and all that. Like how you handle date times is really interesting to me because it's it's a lot more complex than you like would normally think like it's it's a lot more complex than just like basic arithmetic so whoever wrote Luberdate, just it's just straight magic to me like that's that's hadley i think it's hadley and somebody else i think but yeah i want to say like garrett groleman but it's just straight magic like the first time i used Luberdate, i was just like blown away still i still am blown away by it so Hmm. some of the stuff that I can do. I'm not sure who wrote it though. I'm sure Hadley had a Yeah, it was uh Vitali Spinu. Sorry for the mispronunciation if somebody's watching later. And Garrett Grolamond and then Hadley as well. So uh okay, let's talk about lists. Um we'll see if we can at least get to data frames. Like I said, I don't want to go over an hour, but um we could bleed this in over into the next time. So if we need to uh, sometimes called the generic vector, a list can be composed of elements of different types. Um, and so what's interesting about lists, the book mentions that the reason why it can contain or compose elements of different types is because it's just holding the references. It's not actually, um, it doesn't actually contain the objects itself. So it's just holding the references to those objects. And so how do we construct a list? Many of us probably have constructed lists before, but here's a simple list. We can compose it with logicals. We can compose it with integers, doubles, and characters. And if we look at it, it has its own type. So if we use type of, it will return list. But then when we do the structure of the list, you can see that it has four, or reference to four different vectors. You know, here's our logical vector, here's our integer vector, our numeric vector, our, our double vector, and then our character vector. Hmm. Anyways, this is kind of interesting. So I. I, I guess I probably should have looked at this a little bit more, but in the output, it says numeric here, but isn't this technically a double? I wonder why this is the case when you output structure, it gives you numeric rather than double. I know when you use a tibble, it does. It will say double, but I don't know why in base it gives numeric or NUM. Is that just because you could do math with this? Well, you could do math with integer, but. Yeah, I, uh, I feel like I, I had an experience with this, but I'm blanking. Like, I mean, in like real life, but I can't remember. I wonder if we, if I could force this element to like as dot double and it would change this vector type to double. Hmm. It might not be too insightful now, but I just kind of noticed it as I was like looking through these notes again. I'm just like, why is this numeric when it should be a double? Or why is it represented as numeric? But I don't know, we can look into it later. Uh, the nice thing about lists is they can be nested. Uh, they are recursive. So you can make, uh, you could go down as many levels as you want within your list. 
So here's the first level, second level, third level. And then when you look at the structure of it, you can see it's different nesting structure. If you're somebody who works with JSON data um, and you bring in JSON data and you convert it to a list, you're going to have a nested list. And um, sometimes it can get messy. There are some packages that allow you to work with this nested structure, especially if you're working with JSON. But if you convert it to a list, you're probably going to have a nested list. Um, there's some interesting rules when you combine lists. So um, when you combine lists here, um, you know, two lists of one and two, three and four, versus if you combine them with the C function, you can see that the nesting structure stays the same when you use list. But if you use C, it will combine them into two different vectors in one list. And so if you wanted to look at the structure of this, you could see that it's just one list when this is a nested list. So some really interesting stuff when you kind of combine them, whether using list or C. Uh, if you want to test, same thing. Um, I don't know why I got this weird formatting here, but I'll check this. Um, but is that list is the test to do that. Our lang provides a function to do that. That should be is underscore list. Have to fix this. I think I have a back tick that's messed up, but I'll change that in the notes. Um, but they all basically do the same. It's just going to return true or false if it's a list. And so base is dot list. It's true. It is a list. Our lang is list. It's true. Same thing here. Um, is list. Yes, it is. Oh, our lang provides some other thing to like do some additional checking. So if you know that you need to have a list that is a length four, you can provide additional arguments to say, hey, I know this is going to be a list but I also know it's gonna be a list of length four. Is that true? And then it will return true in that case. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, Arlang provides that again, remember that family tree where, where lists kind of live within that. After my coercion rules, apologize. I thought there was some coercion rules here that I have. My mo my note my notes must have got messed up here. Apologies for that. Um, I will double check to make sure that we're not missing anything with coercion. I think my back tick kind of messed up the rendering of it. Let's talk about data frames and tibbles, and I think this will be a good place to leave off, and then we can pick up with null because null doesn't take very long next time. Um, so let's talk about data frames. Data frames, data frames and tibbles are uh, a very special kind of list. Um, they're built on top of a list. And so um, let's talk a little bit about data frames and tibbles. And most of us have probably used a data frame. Most of us have probably used a tibble before. But a data frame basically is just a name list of vectors, right? It's just a name list of vectors that has column names attached to it. It has a class of data frame. It's its own class. And it has two different attributes. It has column names and it has row names. And so when we look at this, how to construct a data frame, most of us are, are pretty familiar with this. We give it a column name. Here's that vector one, two, three. Here's column two, which is a character vector. And then the book still talks about strings as factors being, being having to set it to false, but this is no longer necessary after I think 4.1 but they've changed the default to this argument to being false when it used to default to true. So probably about a year or two ago, if you're creating a data frame or if you were importing data and turning it into a data frame, any character vector that you had would get, get automatically changed into a factor. And so you had to change strings as factor to true or change it to false, but false now is the default. If we inspect it, you can see now that we have a data frame with two columns. We have our uh, we have our atomic vector of uh, numeric here. We have our numeric I don't want to say numeric, but our double vector here, and then our string vector. But if we if we deconstruct it using type of, you can see it's a list. If you look at the attributes, you can see that it has the names, which we provided column one, column two, and then the class, which is data.frame. And then this one's going to have specific to data frames. It's going to have this attribute called row names, which is going to be one, two, and three. The book talks about some disadvantages to row names and why row names are not beneficial and why we should consider using tibbles instead of data frames. Uh, when it comes to data frames, the length of each vector has to be the same. 
Um, I can't remember if it does the recycling rules for data frames. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but these, because it's a rectangular data structure, it should be the same length for all of your vectors. So tibbles are a rethinking of the data frame. Technically, tibbles are uh, data frames. If you look at the attributes for a tibble, you will see data frames are listed, but it just has additional metadata attached to it um, to do a couple things. Uh, data frames are technically lazy and they're also surly. And so we're going to talk about what that means here in a little bit. Lazy basically is, is because tibbles, they will not coerce strings. They will not convert your data like data frames will. Also, tibbles will not transform non-syntactic names. And then also, it will only recycle vectors of length greater than one. And there's an example that's in this. So um, if we looked at this character vector here, where it says, don't fracture me, bro. Again, these aren't my examples, but somebody else created them. But I thought it was kind of interesting to see. If, if it was the default behavior, now it's false, but strings is factor true it would convert this character vector into a factor if you set strings <laughs> as factor equal true. This is no longer the case. Tibbles will not do that. Tibbles automatically, you don't have to have this extra argument. Um, it has no argument to convert it, so it will not convert it to factors. And so you'll see here, if you did have strings as factor equal to true for data frame, you'd see it would turn it into a factor. But for uh, Tibble, it does not. It just keeps it as a string. Syntactic names, again, tibbles will not modify them with data frames. They will. So you can see, unless you change, I think it was check names, it would change it. But here we have the one name here and then the one name here. And you can see when we look at the names for these, you can see that the data frame converted it by appending or adding this prefix of a capital X. With the tibble, it just kept it as one obviously with the two back ticks available to it. So it won't do that. The other important behavior about tibbles is it will only recycle vectors if you have length one. Uh, data frames, they will recycle uh, if you have if you provide a vector that is of a different length. So you'll see here, data frame, we have one, two, three, four. Column number two, we have one and two. It will recycle these values in a data frame. So it will have one, two, and then an additional one, two, it will recycle them. Uh, tibbles will not do that. They will only do it if you provide it with one value. So it throws an error in this case. You can see that it will not recycle one, two, one, two, and repeat. But if you gave it just the value one, it would repeat. So just keep that in mind. You'll get this error if you decide to use tibbles. Last point, because I don't want to go over too much time, is... Um, they're also surly, so tibbles do only what they're asked and complained if they're asked doesn't make sense. So subsetting always yields a tibble. So anytime that you subset, even if you return one column, it's going to return a tibble. And if it can't find a specific column, it will complain at you. So here's a data frame example, just a simple vector of one, two, three, four, tibble, same thing. If we try and subset out a specific column, column one, uh, it will return it for the data frame, uh, but it returns the vector, not the whole data frame itself. Tibbles are a little different. If you return the column, it will always return a tibble. So it will always return that tibble. It won't just return the vector itself. And then if, yep, so same thing here. Uh, to select a vector, do one of these instead. So if you wanted to do this for a tibble, you could just do the double bracket notation, which we'll talk about subsetting here in uh, the next chapter. You can do the double bracket to return just the vector itself if you wanted to do it. There's also a function called dpy or poll, which will return the vector itself. And then the last thing I'll talk about, because I know I'm already two minutes over and I want to give an opportunity for us to discuss anything else, it will complain if it can't find a column. So if you try and pull a column from a data frame, it will try and find something that's close. So if you just did data frame question mark COL, it would pull something that's close to it, which is column one. Tibbles do not have that behavior. If you request a column that's not there, it will just return null. 
And so keep that in mind. So here's some testing functions and you can read more about some of the coercion stuff related to it. So I think, cause we're already at 503, um, I think what we'll do is we'll pick up null for next time. Um, I'll open it up for any discussion. I know I went through this stuff really fast, um, but we had a lot of ground to cover for this information, but what questions or other discussion stuff that people want to add? I got to go back over some of these um, examples just because, yeah, I had forgotten about all this stuff with Tibbles. I, um, I mean, I know that they're like supposed to be like tidier and all that stuff, but I had forgotten all the, well, it was never called Surly and Burly or whatever, but it was, yeah, it was called, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, basically another way of saying what you said, which is the simpler in some ways and more complicated in other ways. I think, honestly, I think if you want like the best explanation of Tibbles is to go to the Tibble documentation mm. and like there is a, there is like a, there's a vignette that talks about like Tibbles and how they're created and how they're used. And I think it does a better job. And then mm. the R for DS chapter on Tibbles is really good too. Um, I don't think this book is okay. I think it assumes that you've already used Tibbles and data frames, mm -hmm. but if you haven't, I would suggest like reading those two to really kind of understand like the design choices behind why a Tibble was created. Yeah. And there's some other stuff too, some like convenience stuff, like how they're printed. Um, Cause it prints more metadata that's associated with it. It takes away row names. Um, the book talks about like the issues with row names um, and why, you know, row names are technically data that should be its own column. Um, but <laughs> I, I've already planted my flag because I'm a tidyverse person. I'm sure there's a lot of benefits for using data frames. Um, but I've just, from my learning, I've used Tibbles a lot. And that's why I'm just like, Tibbles for everything. <laughs> Until you start working with like JSON and list data, and then you want to pull your hair out. So um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with what you're saying. I mean, I think, yeah, better be simple. I got a, I got a jet. I got another thing. It's not a, it's not a meeting this time, Ron. It's, I actually gonna go have dinner with a friend. So okay, have fun, man. I'm, I'm leaving you guys for a much more socially beneficial or, or, or pleasant day. Too. You made it the whole hour. What are you talking about? You did. I it. know. Well, oh yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so chapter three next week. Someone's got yeah. this. Okay. Uh, okay. I think, I think we're skipping for the holiday. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then after that, we'll be subsetting, which which Robert said he would take. Um, but I yeah. think we'll just quickly cover the end of Knowles. Knowles don't take very long, so we'll just finish that up, and then we'll go to Chapter 4 on the 5th. So. Perfect. But, see you guys in uh, then two weeks. Is that yeah, right? see you later, cool. man. Yep, see you later, man. Bye. Anything else that anybody else wants to add? Um uh, the only question I had was, it seems like because tibbles are data frames, they still have row names, but they're always just like one, two, three, four, and you just encourage you to ignore that, I guess, basically. Like, I tried setting their own names to a tibble, and it said, ah, no, you don't. But um, Yeah, I think it's like, it's just like <laughs> implicit, because it's, like, it's not like with like, well, I guess even like the pandas index is like not even really row names, because I feel like the pandas index has like more guarantees. And like, it yeah, seems Pandas like definitely uses equivalent of row names with that uh, column or row index, but the row index is to me just an irritation that I keep having to reset away or something. Probably because I'm not using Pandas right, but I just find I like the Tibbles approach. Get rid of the row names. Yeah. Yeah. It's just irritating. I've, there was like one thing I was working on. It was like, oh my God, my manager pulled up this like really weird. It was essentially like, I don't even remember why I was doing this, but it was like, uh, domain names and it was like the domain name domain names associated with that country and it was that really that one time where i'm like oh wait the pandas like how the data was stored it was like essentially the having the index was very helpful because it just kept like essentially the position of uh some of like the data i was like manipulating which is very helpful um i think they definitely get more i don't know the more i use pandas the more i like appreciate the index more even if like I don't fully like rock it um whereas like with tibbles right, it's a lot easier um just like manipulate data and so right. on and so forth 
I mean, the other thing about Tibbles that you have, like the design decision behind Tibbles is because Tibbles, their, their use transfers across all the tidyverse. It's a data structure that you know that if you pass to a tidyverse function, it should work as expected. Yeah. Right. And so that was one of the design decisions of Tibbles was like, it's a data structure that we're going to create that we know that works across all these different packages. Yeah. And so that's like, that's another benefit too, that if you're going to be working in the tidyverse, you just know that this data structures, it should work. Right. Yeah. And I haven't worked with pandas a lot. I'm still trying to learn Python and stuff. So it's like the, so like in my, in my job, I had to switch over to Python most because my manager because in Python. So it's like a few months I was trying to like really fight it. And I'm like, I'm R, I like R. It's like a way easier. Um, there is actually, let's put it in the chat. Um, let's find it. There's this guy I've seen on Twitter. His name is Matt Harris. And he kind of just does like consulting work um, essentially around like Python and yeah, like, that consults, like different familiar. companies. Um, he wrote this book called Effective Pandas. Oh, yeah, um, I have that. That's a great book. I knew that name sounded familiar. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially probably the one book that I was like, oh, like this really changed my view on pandas. Um, what yeah. he likes to call right method chaining, maybe you've seen it in some posts. Yeah. It's very much like how you would pipe, um, use like the pipe right operator in R, where, um, because at least how with Python, like essentially, if you like it have like some block of code in parentheses, you can actually then evaluate it. You can actually capture the state step by step. So it's very much like, you know, how when we're, you know, using like dplyr, right? You're using like select and then group by and summarize and all that good stuff. You can actually really do a lot of that in pandas. Um, so that was, at least for me and my own experience is what kind of got me over like the mental hurdle of like writing in pandas. Um, just being able to take that idea of chaining functions together um, and then applying it to, you know, like a different language is really what made it click a lot more for me. So like when I do like work in pandas, I'm not like, God damn it, this is like infuriating. I mean, there are some annoying things for sure that aren't as uh, <laughs> as nice as you get in like with tibbles and R, right? Um, but it, yeah, it really did change at least my view on like what, I think good pandas code should be. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interface design. Too. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ryan. I was, was going to say I do recommend that book too. That effective. Yeah, I mean, I think it's too. it's just interface design too, right? Like, you know, there's just been a lot of time spent thinking about like with the tidyverse, at least from my perspective, is like there's a lot of thinking behind like the interface to making it simple because it's not. And again, I don't, I can't speak for Python and I don't want to start a, start a, a flame war or something or someone to, to tweet oh, me and no. be like, if yeah. anything, but it's like, from my experience, from my limited time learning Python, it's, it's like, it, it's for, it's for different use cases or for different users. Like, you know, Tidyverse initially was designed for, you know, interactive data analysis. Right. And yep. Python is more of a, uh, general programming language, you know, there's obviously packages for data analysis. And so, you know, it's just that interface design, right? And there's just been a lot of push to focus this interface design for Tidyverse to be like interactive data analysis. Yeah. And there's just a lot of convenience to that too. So, but yeah, totally I can't agree. speak towards using pack. I, if I use pandas every single day, I could probably have a better <laughs> argument for or against, but so nobody yeah. who's watching this later, if somebody else watch this, don't, <laughs> Do not don't tweet. at me in Twitter or whatever. Or <laughs> if it's going to be Mastodon or whatever, don't be like, hey, Colin. <laughs> yeah, but actually there's better ways to do it. And I'm sure there is. I just, in my day-to-day -day work, I've just you know, <laughs> used Tidyverse stuff. So No, I, I, I totally agree and understand. And there's people who will do the data table stuff too, who are just like adamant about like the structure of using data table and, you know, some of the benefits of using that and data frames. And, yeah. you know, I've tried doing that too. Um, I just, it's, it's hard to break old habits. <laughs> to try, it's hard to learn new tricks sometimes. So definitely. Uh, anything else that anybody wants to add? I know this was yeah, like nope. a quick, quick blaze through the different types, but um, there's a lot of ground to cover in this, but a lot of it's like foundational stuff that there's not really anything too like. Yeah, I mean, I think the next shattering here, the next chapter on subsetting, I was going to say the next chapter on subsetting will probably help uh, solidify some of these things too. 
definitely it's taking the weird, same structures apart. weird behaviors of subsetting <laughs> yeah exactly very weird so with that um just looking at the schedule here is we're going to skip for the holiday so it looks like 11 28 we'll skip at least that's what's in the schedule now so i'll just stick with the schedule and then we'll come back together on the fifth and um robert you said you would cover chapter four yep and then we're still looking for somebody who might be interested in control flow if not um happy to cover it uh, but if somebody wants to do control flow um just put your name in there and we'll go from there so if that's okay. if, if nobody has anything else to share or anything to discuss that's all we have and i'll, I'll see you guys in uh two weeks all right cool okay see right. you in two weeks bye everyone right, i'll see everybody <laughs>